Today on Everyday Injustice, we have Emily Galvin Almanza. Welcome back to our show. How are you doing? It's always so good to be here. I'm really happy to be back. Thanks for having me. So what is your world like these days? Oh man, what's all of our world like these days? A sort of unfolding series of crises. Um, but uh, setting aside the global crises, um, the world of enhancing and expanding public defense is actually a really interesting place right now. Um, because even in the wake of you know, a lot of strides forward in the last two years on criminal legal reform, and then a lot of sort of police propaganda and fear mongering in response to that, and a lot of inaccuracies in the media broadly, we are still seeing a tremendous um, outpouring of interest from state and local governments in ways to invest in the safety of their community that are not violent or carceral or policing oriented. And so where I stand at the intersection of sort of public defense and social work and social service, um, sort of fighting the fight for public defenders to be able to address the 44,000 collateral consequences that police and prosecutors cause, things are looking really exciting because more and more state and local governments are choosing to invest in their defenders to expand and take on these challenges. That makes it, you know, a time when we, I want to knock on what we might see like hope of a brighter future in my world. Um, it's very early, but it's exciting. Well, I, I like hearing the optimism because I'm not seeing a lot of optimism out here. Um, so we'll get into that in a second. But um, for the uh, knowledge of our viewers and listeners, uh, um, maybe tell us a little bit about your background. You've done just about everything, it seems. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> uh, so um, I'll, I'll stick to the relevant parts of my background because there's definitely some, <laughs> some things I've done that we don't need to go into. Um, but I was a public defender really from my very first year of law school. I spent my first summer at the LA County Public Defender's Office. After graduation, went to the Santa Clara County Public Defender's Office and spent some time with the Three Strikes Project as well. Uh, working to bring people sentenced to life in prison home after the reform of California's Three Strikes Project. I then went out to the Bronx Defenders, which was this really cool, is this really cool office um, in New York that's doing something called holistic defense, where basically um, clients can have an interdisciplinary team of attorneys and social workers and investigators and non-attorney advocates to support them when they are in, ensnared in our criminal legal system. And I loved practicing that way. I love being able to say, you know what? I actually don't know how to do eviction defense, but my colleague Ashley does. And I'm going to walk you over to her desk right now. Like that was beautiful to be able to say yes to my clients and defend the 80% of people who are represented by public defenders the way people of wealth and privilege are generally defended, which is with a great deal of concern for each person's needs and challenges and priorities and goals. But the whole time I was there, I was saying, like, this is really sweet. I think this is like the only proper way to defend people. Why doesn't this exist everywhere? And how can we make it feasible for this to exist everywhere? Because, you know, I have experience working in a county agency public defender. And I have friends who are working in heavily under-resourced public defenders and thinking about the challenges of how do you do this, this beautiful way of defending people, whole people, um, in a very resource scarce or county restricted or like, you know, in, in a variety of, of environments. After all, public defense in America is not a system. It is a dispersed set of entities and individuals scattered over 3,142 counties and the District of Columbia. So when you design a system for defenders, you have to design, design something that's really, really modular and adaptable and like adjustable to local context and needs and practice. So I designed a program called Partners for Justice, which I co-founded with my dear friend from first grade, Rebecca Solo, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is a boon because she's not a public defender. In our public defender world, so many of the programs to like transform public defense are run by public defenders, which is great in some ways, but like she brings a mission-driven management consultant skill set with like a very, you know, MBA organizational intelligence uh, skill set. And that's incredibly valuable to have on our team. So I started a program to try and basically help any defender anywhere that wants to take on a more interdisciplinary kind of practice and wants to expand their service menu for clients. 
helping them do that, not 10 years from now, not five years from now, but like right now, <laughs> literally right now. We do that in two ways. One involves embedding staff with that defender to literally expand their service profile within a matter of weeks. The other way is offering them sort of capacity building and support to teach them how to use their existing personnel to do that. Um, but both have been really successful. We went from two pilots to 20 locations in four years, and we've eliminated at this point through that way of practicing over 200 years in jail for our clients. Wow. So give us like an example of something on the ground that you can kind of point to. So um, one office I'm really proud of is the state of Delaware. Delaware is really cool. It's a, it's a statewide system. Um, and when we came to Delaware, we wanted, we, we, it was one of our two pilot sites. We went to them and we said, hey, we like, want to try this thing. Can you try this, this new way of practicing? And the cool thing about Delawareans is Delawareans are always known for smart solutions and testing things. They are, it is a cultural ethos of that state. So we piloted the program in Delaware, fully philanthropically funded. We embedded a team of non-attorney advocates, brilliant new professionals, many fresh out of college, um, willing to like work out the kinks of the system. We at Partners for Justice trained them to do housing stabilization, job readiness and job search work, um, benefits applications, treatment services, navigation, you know, substance use, mental health treatment, um, licensure work, educational advocacy, sort of this whole world of things that people need help with when they are having their life sort of unthreaded by the criminal legal system. So we embedded these trained advocates with the Office of Defense Services in Delaware, and they committed to two years of working with clients on all of these we call them collateral consequences, but they're not really collateral at all because they're highly impactful and really central to people's lives. Um, but what's so cool is that the value that these, these advocates brought was so substantial and so striking and so noticeable. Um, they were getting better outcomes because of course, every time they would achieve a really exciting goal with a client, they were able to bring that back into the criminal legal matter in the form of mitigation. And basically going and telling judges, hey, you know, judge or prosecutor, you might be coming after this young mom for shoplifting, but actually she was, didn't have the right public benefits or didn't have the right access to treatment, medication, et cetera. And we solved those problems. And now she's got a job. She's got a place to live. She's doing really well. You can just drop those charges against her. It's really persuasive. So this team started demonstrating substantial value in this office. And actually the governor of the state of Delaware was able to allow the public defender to put these advocate roles in their actual budget going forward. And then we grew to the rest of the state. We've now spread to downstate Delaware to Kent and Sussex. Um, and we are trying to demonstrate the same value proposition. If we do so, Delaware will be the first state to have collaborative defense statewide in Delaware. And having that um, trajectory of demonstrating value and then garnering government support and actually redefining what the public defender does and who they are and what their role is in the community, that's the ball game. So hopefully Delaware will be our shining example. And you kind of reminded me actually uh, listening to you of some of the interesting uh, perceptions that public defenders kind of have. And we saw a little bit of that um, in the Jackson uh, confirmation hearings. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, it, it's kind of interesting because public defenders really are, as I always say, on the front line of criminal defense uh, and, and the criminal justice system. And a lot of people don't seem to understand that they don't get to pick their clients. Um, so, you know, if your client uh, is alleged to have committed a certain crime, you don't get the choice of, oh, I'm not defending that person. I don't like them, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, but nobody seems to understand that. You know, you're, it's a really good point. And it's actually something we screen for when we're interviewing advocate candidates being like, you know, you don't get to pick your cases. Like you will be defending people who have engaged in harm, who have engaged in real and serious harm. We defend folks on domestic violence cases, on sexual assault cases. Um, but here's the thing for me, there's, there's a couple of, of things about it. One is that I see the law a lot like a very, very, very messed up form of medicine. 
doctors don't turn away people <laughs> because of their, con- they don't say, oh, your condition is really skeeving me out right now. I don't, I don't want to work on that. Take that to the next ER. Um, and lawyers don't do that either. And both are professionals who you need when you are in crisis with a problem that may be very embarrassing and is also not representative of who you are. Um, so I think that the fundamental tenant, we, we talk a lot about public defense as being, you know, smart on crime and tough on injustice is one way of putting it. Um, and we also talk a lot about defending the constitution, about standing up, you know, to be as the PDS slogan, which I love, the liberty's last champion, um, to be the lawyer that you hope you never need, but boy, are you grateful for them if you do need them. But I also think of it, I think that a lot of these conceptualizations of public defense as this very noble, constitutional, honorable mandate. They're all true, but they also kind of erase all of the healing that public defenders do. Because on a daily, I mean, I can tell you, I've represented thousands of people. I have actually never met someone who engaged in harm for no reason at all. Everybody who I've met who's engaged in serious harm did so for a reason. And sometimes that reason is substance use or a mental health concern. Sometimes it's deep trauma. Sometimes it's toxic masculinity. Like sometimes, There's always a reason. And as a defender, when you have the space to unpack what is actually going on with your client and what they need in order to ideally never engage in harm again, but unlike other system actors, doing it from a client-led, respectful, supportive perspective, as in what do you need in order to have the life you want. Because nobody wants a life of like getting arrested repeatedly and engaging in harm. Nobody actually wants that. Public defenders have this tremendous trusted confidential relationship with folks that gives them the ability when they're properly resourced to create really lasting support and healing for people who need that. Now, is that a solution for everybody? No, I mean, Charlie Manson is out there. I just haven't represented him. Um, and I, you know, but if you imagine people who engage in violence as all standing in a big room and some of the people are in that room because of a mental health condition and we can get those people out of the room with the right kind of treatment support. And some of the people are in there because of, you know, substance use issues and we can get those people out of the room with a different kind of treatment support. And some people are in there because of they're reenacting patterns of profound trauma that they have just had in their lives for a long time. After all, so many public defender clients are also survivors of crime and survivors of harm. And we can get those people out of the room with a different kind of support. Um, Then you've got people in the room who may be acting in desperation from the crushing pressures of poverty or lack of opportunity or lack of education. Those are other solutions that they need, but that will still get them out of the room. At a certain point, we're gonna be left with very few people in that room. And that, that way of attacking actual commission of harm is so much more effective than trying to hope that a cage will fix something. Yeah, and I think, you know, that, that's a really good point. And it's a point that I often make is that, you know, when you get down to it, there are, you know, the real scary, dangerous people. But unlike, I think, the public perception, that number of people is very small. Um, and, and most people are, you know, in there for a variety of reasons. And if they can get the proper resources and treatment, um, you know, they can get their lives turned around. Um, and, you know, one of the things that's kind of impressed me and I've been able to kind of witness even in the 15 years that I've been doing this, which is a relatively short period of time is, how much um, public defense has changed from simply, you know, going into court to this notion of holistic defense, where you know we're not just trying to get these people off, we're we're trying to give them resources so they don't come back. You know, okay, but here's the big secret, right? Is like that that's how rich people always got defended. Is that if you are paying a thousand dollars for a legal team? you expect that legal team to be worried about your employment license and about, you know, the home you're trying to purchase right now and about the college that you just got into, like whatever stage of life you're at, if you're paying a thousand dollars an hour for your defense, you expect that defense to preserve your whole life. And even more importantly, your whole future. And I think we've come to accept this idea that that type of defense is reserved for the privileged few who can pay for it. 
and that everybody else, the 80% of people who are <laughs> not in that category, um, are just subject to having their future thrown away or their potential erased and denigrated. Um, so I think what we're seeing in the profession, whether people are practicing holistic defense, client-centered, you know, community-oriented defense, or as you know, what we what we practice is, is collaborative defense, whatever way you're doing it, it is a form of insisting that public defense should be as good or better than the best defense money can buy. And you can't make it as good or better unless you involve other disciplines, because that's what the white shoe firms do. So I want to um, kind of backtrack a little bit, um, because I know you uh, worked on the Stanford Three, uh, Three Strikes project. And of course, um, you know, Michael Romero and his, his wonderful work, um, you know, you were doing that when you were in law school or when, when did you get a chance to do that? Oh man, I wouldn't leave Mike Romano alone. I worked in law school, yes. I, um, I signed up as a student for what was then the Three Strikes Clinic. Notably, Stanford Law School did not yet have a criminal defense clinic for me to be in. They had a criminal prosecution clinic to which I am allergic. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I showed up in the, in the Three Strikes Project and, and, and kind of never left. Um, I had the honor of um, working on one case during my time in law school on which we were successful in bringing someone home, uh, a person who was sentenced to life in prison for stealing, I believe, $27 worth of plumbing supplies from Home Depot, um, and with whom I am actually still in touch and still very good friends. So it's nice for, for those of you who think public defense is just about representing people and like leaving into the night. No, no, no. We're still friends <laughs> over a decade later. Um, and then I went to be, you know, a trial lawyer at Santa Clara County Public Defender. I had already committed to doing a clerkship with Judge Felton Henderson in the Northern District of California. So after I spent a year at the Defender, I went to go do my clerkship. At the end of that year, I wanted to go back into public defense, but the three strikes reform had just passed. And suddenly there were thousands of people who were eligible to come home if they could get counsel to assist with that process. So then I went back to Mike Romano and knocked on his door again. <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, do you need a litigator? Here I am. Um, so I, it was my honor to defend and, you know, fight on behalf of um, several of the first people to come home under the three strikes reform. I will admit that after some time when the public defenders really had the rest of these cases quite well in hand and, and you know, I, I felt like I really missed being a trial lawyer. Um, that's when I went back out to Bronx Defenders in order to kind of get back into the courtroom. Did I know that, you know, New York's total lack of adequate speedy trial protections means that cases go to trial once a millennia? I did not know that at the time, but, <laughs> but happily I was able to, to represent some folks at trial there as well. Yeah, it's really interesting. One of the first cases that, that we actually covered was a three strikes case out of Yolo County. Uh, where the guy was facing a third strike offense for stealing a bag of shredded cheese. And um, uh, it, it's a great learning experience. And I actually use this case uh, even now when I train the interns because, uh, you know, literally we were the only ones who knew about this case. And because we covered it, it ends up getting covered in the New York Times and the Guardian of London. Uh, but, um, and because of that, it embarrassed the DA's office enough that they, um, you know, agreed to a, a plea agreement where they struck the last strike. So that sounds like a great win, right? Except that the guy gets seven years and eight months um, for stealing a bag of shredded cheese. Um, now, the good news is a couple of years later, um, you know, when uh, Prop, uh, what was it, 36 uh, passed, um, you know, he, he finally got out. Uh, so he didn't serve the full eight years. Uh, but, you know, this is just a classic case where, um, you know, in this case, the guy had like 20 bucks in his pocket. Uh, so why is he stealing it? It's not because he needs it. Oh, it's because he's mentally ill, but we can't like treat the mental illness, right? We have to throw the guy in a cage for eight year, or sorry, uh, they were originally trying for 25 to life. Yeah. 
I mean, that that petty theft with a prior, right? This yep. sort of like beautiful California construction in which you can get massive years in prison for a literal petty theft shoplifting bag of cheese. I mean, people often think of California as like this sort of bastion of progressive values. And I I, <laughs> I remember spending many years trying to explain like, no, 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 it's like, it's like the land of fruit and prison. That's, <laughs> that's, that's what's out there. Um, it has really, you know, deep regressive carceral problems. I'm very proud of how much progress California has made in recent years in thinking critically about what works and investing in solutions that actually are likely to diminish harm as opposed to solutions that are sort of our traditional and very um, punitive but also retributive ways of engaging harm. I think it's hard for policymakers because the punitive and regressive stuff feels good to voters who are mad at someone or scared of someone. But when you make policy based on who you're mad at or who you're scared of, you don't get policy that creates safety. You get policy that creates good feelings and cycles of harm. Good feelings and people who want to extract punishment and cycles of harm for everybody, literally everybody in the community because you know jail is actually criminogenic and prison is certainly not <laughs> restorative. Um, so I'm proud of the state for kind of being brave enough to break out of that, who are we scared of and who are we mad at cycle and really try to invest in problem solving that is evidence-based. And I mostly agree with that, but I'm very worried right now. Um, and let me tell you a story. Um, so you probably heard that there was a mass shooting uh, a week ago in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. One of the interesting things that came out of it, they still haven't caught the actual people that uh, they think were involved in the shooting, but they've arrested some people on weapons offenses. Mm -hmm. And one of the people that they arrested on weapons offenses, uh, the Sacramento Bee just reported last week that um, the guy had been given a previous 10 year sentence for uh, uh, what reads to be a pretty bad domestic violence case. Um, and he got out earlier this year and um, the B reports that, um, you know, uh, he had uh, been through the parole process, the DA who's pretty regressive, uh, fought the parole process and he was released anyway. Um, and so now we, we see like uh, there was a, a article today in the B that uh, the Republicans are asking the governor uh, to, uh, to prevent early releases uh, and all sorts of other things. And then it comes out that actually he didn't get out because of any of these new laws or any kind of early release. He got out because of time served. Yeah. Um, basically, he was in custody for 508 days uh, pre-trial uh, or, or pre-plea. Uh, he pled like most people. And um, so he had and a lot of credit for factored into his release. Um, yeah. and, and so there's a there's this big backlash building over a lie. Yeah. Well, there's also I mean. Any way you cut it, let's pretend that we are aliens viewing Earth from, you know, a thousand light years away, <laughs> looking, looking down on our planet and trying to figure out like what's happening here. If you look at this without the presumption that prison is good or traditional or, you know, necessary or whatever, you would say clearly whatever they did to this person to make the person stop engaging in harm didn't work and maybe made it worse, right? Like this to me is an indictment of the way we respond to harm and whether it works. Um, I think that there's a lot of work to be done. I mean, Danielle Surad famously says that, what are the things that cause people to engage in harm? Well, trauma, isolation, and lack of opportunity. What does prison cause? Trauma, isolation, and lack of opportunity. So to me, if somebody comes home and engages in harm, there's two different factors I'm concerned about there. One is what happened during the time they were in prison, because clearly it did not help anybody. Uh, two is how did they come home? Because that in itself can be extremely disorienting and can be criminogenic if handled really, really badly. Often people are released. I mean, I remember, you know, I'd had clients in California released, you know, in a paper jumpsuit, like with, with nowhere to go, like, good luck, here's a bus ticket. 
see you when you come back. It, Here's your two hundred dollar gate money. Exactly. Um, so I hope that lawmakers see this for what it is, which is an indictment of our current system for responding to harm and the urgent need to invest in other forms of safety. I mean, we just can't have all our eggs in the prison basket. We got to put some of our eggs in the alternative intervention basket. And how do we do that? Because what I am starting to see again is crime happens. Oh, bad, bad, um, which, OK, fine, I get it. It, it, it's, you know, what happened in Sacramento, horrible, and, and we don't want to try to sweep that under the rug. But, you know, I, I think what what's getting missed is, okay, what we're doing isn't working. And there are actually, you know, a lot of research that shows that there are better ways to do things. But We'd rather spend eighty to a hundred thousand dollars to lock somebody in a cage than spend eighty to a hundred thousand dollars to fix them. Yeah, and I mean, I, I, I feel like there's some really powerful examples out there. Most of the processes that work the best are consensual, which is unsurprising. People have known in the addiction context for a long time that you can't force somebody to do something they don't want to do if somebody's not ready. To you know, engage in sobriety, it's not going to work. Um, I mean, how old is the expression? You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. It's as this is as old as that. We've known this for as long as that. Um, I think something that's really beautiful are some of the restorative justice processes, like Danielle's work, um, that are consensual, that involve the person who engaged in harm and the person who was harmed, you know, in a survivor-led way, coming to their own reckoning, their own engagement in what the survivor needs in order to heal and move forward and what kind of accountability the perpetrator needs to take on in order to foster that, uh, that healing. I think that's more powerful because it acknowledges a couple of things. One is that each situation is unique. There is no like one size fits all solution for why people engage in harm and why people are harmed. Um, Two is that it's consensual and it involves invoking someone's own desire to change and not engage in harm again. Um, and three is that it's nonviolent. I mean, I think every systemic response to harm that our government has is at some level violent. It is controlling someone's body and subjecting them to fear and control of their movements. And we know in many cases like actual violence. Um, so to me coming up, you know, increasing access to processes that prove very, very effective because they are tailored. I mean, violence is extremely serious. Should we treat violence with a one size fits all solution? No, we should be treating violence with the attention, care and expertise it deserves to come to you know resolutions that last better. Like I, I think that um, Danielle has some pretty exemplary results and I think other restorative justice programs are similar. I also think that um, when it comes to the means of doing violence, I mean, I think I have very complicated feelings on the Second Amendment, <laughs> but I just think that um, setting up a world in which we have extremely limited access to therapeutic, mental health, supportive medical resources and abundant weaponry uh, is not setting ourselves up for safety. And that's not an endorsement of carceral means to like restrict guns and, you know, let's be real about who gets their guns taken away. It's primarily black men who are arrested for gun possession offenses and, you know, white men who are wearing their AK to Walmart. So like, I don't think that way of dealing with it is good either, but I do think increasing the availability of treatment and support and decreasing the availability of weaponry would be probably good for public safety. Um, so what do you see as alternatives to incarceration because you know in my view we really over incarcerate uh we, we put a lot of people into cages that really aren't a threat to society um they might be a threat to themselves um but that goes to the mental health issue um i, I mean what do you see as, as you know some of the better alternatives that we might have? 
So you're absolutely right that the vast majority of people in our criminal legal system do not need to be forcibly restrained. <laughs> Excuse me. We don't need to have a ton of the people that we have um, in local jails or in prison. Um, I do think that the trouble with alternatives to incarceration is that most policymakers want like a simple program. They want like a program that just fixes violence. There's just like, you know, and again, Danielle comes close, but like they want like a one size fits all, like it's not jail, it's the problem solving court. And when you go to the problem solving court, you get your problem solved and then you're fine. And I think that um, one of the hardest things to grapple with about diminishing utilization of prisons and jails is that it really requires massive in investment in prevention. And prevention doesn't look like criminal legal system stuff. Prevention looks like housing. It looks like access to nutritious food and childcare and early childhood education. And it looks like clean water that doesn't have lead in it. And it looks like, you know, it looks like access to jobs, not just any jobs, but meaningful jobs with which you can feed your family and have a place to live. I mean, prevention looks like um, societal stability in every form and access to hope and opportunity and economic mobility. Um, and obviously much more access to mental health and substance use care. So that's not easy for policymakers to grasp because the link isn't quick. It's not like a person did a bad thing and then you send them to this court and then they don't do the bad thing anymore. It's maybe we can pre prevent 100,000 bad things because we invested in clean water and great childhood education for this community. And it's gonna take years before we see that investment pay off. Or maybe if we have you know, a neighborhood where we've gone, you know, we've increased access to affordable housing and also created more universal healthcare coverage systems so that people can be housed and also have access to support and care with a universal you know, basic income plan so that people have the big, th the big three of violence prevention, housing, income, and access to care. You know, that's what that looks like. Does it have a big splashy payoff? No, because when you prevent the bad thing, you never have the bad thing happen in the first place. So there's no like, aha, um, there's a careful tracking of data and crime rates over time. <laughs> like, it's not politically sexy. Um, yeah, it, and that's a real problem um, because, you know, it, you know, it's why, you know, the the person that gets early release who commits a crime gets all the focus and, you know, the hundreds that get early release and get jobs, uh, nobody's really paying attention to. Um, That's kind of what I loved about the, the Keep Them Home campaign is we got to hear so many people's stories of like what they were doing when they were released under the COVID rules and what they were doing was like, getting their computer, you know, information systems certificate, and like, you know, becoming a pastor. And like, we just don't hear enough of those stories. I was reading a book and there was um, a really interesting point made by the author. Um, and he was looking at uh, the murders in St. Louis, um, which is of course, you know, the, the city with the highest murder rate in the country for several years. And, um, you know, somebody pointed out to him that there was one big commonality with all the people murdered over a several year period. Every single person that was murdered and every single person that committed the murder, none of them had graduated from high school. Mm. And that just blew me away. I mean, it, you know, if you think about it, it's not shocking necessarily, but it is at, at some level shocking that it's that stark. Yeah. I actually was, I was thinking about this a lot recently because I had someone poo-poo me on Twitter and I really don't like being poo-pooed on Twitter, but I was talking about how, how educal, uh, had educational attainment is linked to reduction in likelihood to engage in harm. Education is pro-safety. And they were like, well, you know, the research on this, not robust. And I was like, you know, we also suffer in our field from a huge dearth of research because a lot of our data is dispersed over a gajillion different systems and difficult to attain. And I think there's so many challenges with doing robust research in our space. Um, 
and also the, the amount of years <laughs> required for like meaningful research about you know what is criminogenic and what is pro safety. Um, I I think a person would be pretty hard pressed to argue that educational attainment at this point is not linked to lower incidence of harm. I think that what we don't talk about enough is all of the ways in which people are shut out from that attainment early on. I mean, in California, you've got police officers, especially in the gang policing context, approaching children as young as six or seven on the street routinely. Uh, there was a study that came out a couple of days ago that showed that one contact with police, and I'm not talking about arrest, I'm talking about a conversation, an investigatory conversation with a police officer immediately causes children to experience anxiety, depression, and disengagement from school. So when you think about what we've done as we put police into our schools, we encourage police to approach people of color, primarily children of color in the community in that investigatory manner, um, we are creating anxiety and depression and disengagement from school and a sense of hopelessness about the future in millions of children, specifically black and brown children. Then you layer on the fact that if you get into trouble, I mean, you got police in schools, but only in certain schools. So kids of privilege are not getting arrested for their bag of weed. They're getting detention and a call to their parents and kids in less privileged schools are getting, you know, a criminal charge. Um, You've got a system that criminalizes childhood things. I, by the way, I can't tell you, I've represented so many kids for doing stuff that I did when I was a kid. I represented a girl who punched a bully who was like beaten up on her little sister. She got charged with a felony in California. I mean, like, I'm not gonna say that in my day, you pat the kid on the back. Punching is never okay. I'm a mom now, punching is never okay. But like, again, we've criminalized the actions of childhood. There's a so difference they, between punching and uh, getting grounded and punching and getting a felony. Right, a felony. So we've set up a system where children are criminalized. Um, and then also you have to remember that kids can get removed from school even for things that have nothing to do with school. So let's say a kid punches their stepdad who they fight with at home. That has nothing to do with school. That did not happen at school. In many states, they can still get suspended or expelled from that school and often rerouted to a different educational system entirely, a sort of alternative or more carceral educational context. Fighting to get kids back into their original school is often a process in which the school is represented by counsel and the child is sitting there alone. So we need more people protecting kids in the suspension and expulsion context. Then you've got the trouble of even if somebody makes it through that those challenges of grade school, um, the lack of opportunity to go on into secondary education. I mean, how many people have criminal convictions that are gonna prevent them from getting certain educational loans or prevent them from being admitted to certain colleges or certain graduate programs? We have to stop coupling criminal record with future attainment in very key ways because what it's doing is it's allowing the mass criminalization of black and brown youth to be massively preventative of future opportunities. Yeah, and you know, I think one of the big issues that I always point out is, you know, when you look at suspensions, when you look at uh, children that, that end up in the criminal legal system, when you look at policing in schools, it's not falling on, you know, the privileged uh, white kids in Davis. Um, it's falling on uh, the children of color and uh, maybe the working class kids um and and that's that's the big problem you know who who didn't smoke you know uh a bowl of weed when they were in high school um and you know for most white kids in suburbia that's like you know a rite of passage except for you know a few people um and and yet you know we see you know in inner city kids uh or kids of color they end up uh, becoming their access point, their first point of entry uh, to the criminal legal system. Yeah, and we've allowed it to echo in these ways that are really, really toxic. Um, I think a lot about the sort of algorithms. Cash bail is really bad and you should not condition liberty on ability to pay. Like nobody in America should be buying their freedom at this point. Um, but when we replace cash bail, we often do it with algorithms that are simply perpetuating these issues. 
So for example, often an algorithm that determines whether a person should be released or held in jail, which may be the most significant decision in, in a criminal case, whether a person is fighting those charges from home with their family or in a jail cell. Um, we condition them on factors like, well, has this person had prior contacts with the system? What do the prior contacts look like? And in a world where police are so much more likely to contact black and brown men and so much more likely to arrest black and brown young people for very, very, very minor things, you've just created an algorithm that is going to systematically disadvantage black and brown people. Um, I think that we need to really grapple with the degree to which systemic racism, I mean, by which I mean like the racism of the system, the way it is built itself, not any one individual within that system, but the system's structure itself um, has created a world in which many forms of automation and supposedly or like seemingly evidence-based decision-making are actually just perpetuating racist data. All right. Well, we could go on all day on this stuff. Um, I know I could talk about this all day, um, but we are out of time. Uh, so I wanted to thank you for coming on our show. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate being here. Uh, if anyone wants to learn more about Partners for Justice or our work, you can check us out at www.partnersforjustice.org. Emily Galvan Almanza from Partners for Justice has been our guest this week. This has been Everyday Injustice. I'm your host, David Greenwald. Join us again next time for more tales from the injustice system. <laughs>